So the circuit that I'm about to draw is the MOSFET representation of a current mirror. We have a power supply voltage, VDD. We have some reference current generator uh, that I'm going to call IREF, like so. And then we have a diode connected MOSFET, where the phrase diode connected means in this case that I am tying the drain of transistor M1. So here is the drain one, here is the source of one, and here is the gate of one. And the drain and the gate are tied together. Let's call this M1. And what this part of the circuit is, is effectively a MOSFET voltage source, right? So our reference current forces some amount of current to flow through this transistor M1, because we know that none of it can branch off and flow through the gate, uh, at least at a DC level. Uh, and so um, because the drain and the gate are tied together, this device is effectively forced to always operate in saturation because VDS will always be greater than VGS minus VTH since VDS and VGS are the same quantity. And so effectively we're forcing a particular gate voltage to occur that will keep this transistor in saturation. And then over here on the right-hand side, we will have another transistor, bless you. Where this is the drain of two, the source of two and the gate of two. And so this guy will be carrying some current ID two, excuse me. So by inspection, we can see that ID one is equal to I ref. And thus the gate source voltage for transistor M1 will be VTH plus the square root of twice I ref over UN CX W over L for transistor one. So that's what that subscript means next to the W over L ratio is the aspect ratio for transistor one. And this will also equal VGS2, right? So here's VGS1, here's VGS2, and obviously those voltages have to be the exact same voltage because they're both between voltage measured between that same node where our gates are tied together and ground. So If the aspect ratio of transistor M2 is equal to the aspect ratio of transistor M1, then ID2 has to equal ID1 which again is simply IRF. Now there is a caveat to this that we'll discuss momentarily. And we call this um, the current flowing through M1 is 
mirrored or copied in M2. So that's why this is a current mirror. Okay. So important things to note here. As I mentioned a moment ago, transistor M1 is always in saturation because VDS1 is equal to VGS1 and this will always be greater than VGS1 minus VTH. Our second note is that M2 I'm sorry, I need to All right, so M2 is assumed to be in saturation where this will mean that VDS2 has to be greater than or equal to VGS2 minus VTH. Now, as I've drawn this circuit, we don't know what is connected to the drain of transistor M2. So effectively, if we want our current mirror to operate correctly, we need to make sure that whatever, <coughs> excuse me, whatever we load this current mirror with will satisfy that condition. Um, because if the voltage at the, uh, the DC voltage at the drain of transistor M2 gets too low, it'll force transistor M2 into the triode region, and then we no longer have current mirroring. So we're not making a copy of our reference current. We are just biasing this other thing poorly, okay? So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, a third observation that we could make is that channel length modulation will affect the mirroring. So our current ID2 will be approximately IRF plus some quantity delta I. If VDS2 is exactly VGS2, 
then our delta i quantity is zero. If BDS2 is greater than BGS2, our delta I quantity will be positive. And if VDS2 is less than VGS2, our delta I quantity will be negative. So what this means graphically, if this is our drain current, and this is our VDS voltage, and let's call this ID2 and VDS2, what we would expect is that our current would look something like this. Where this point right here corresponds to the voltage VGS1, which is the same as the voltage VGS2, okay? Now, let me... So at this particular value, we are carrying exactly I ref. As our VDS quantity is greater, we're effectively just moving further to the right on this graph, where this purple line corresponds to I ref plus some current delta I. So it's not going to be a huge change in the mirroring, but it is not an exact copy. Similarly, this point down here will correspond to IRF minus some current delta I, which happens when VDS for our transistor M2 is slightly less than VGS1. So we can see a pretty large swing uh, in our mirrored current value uh, depending on how prevalent channel length modulation is going to be all right and then beyond this point we run into the issue of pushing it into the triode region of operation all right so let's go to the next page here Current mirroring can be used to make multiple copies of the reference current. So if we had the following circuit, here is our basic current mirror.
here. I'm just going to put ID1. So this is our basic current here. If we tie more transistors to where they share effectively the same potential at the source and the same potential at the gate. So something like this. So this is M3. Then transistor M3 will also carry a copy of the reference current. So will transistor M4 over here. Where ID1 will be equal to ID2, will be equal to ID3, will be equal to ID4 if W over L1 is equal, W over L2 is equal to all the way up to W over L. So effectively, if we make all of these transistors identical, then we're making just multiple copies of the same current over and over and over again, right? If we change the aspect ratios of the transistor, that allows us to scale the reference current. Okay. So it mirror it and you can multiply. Yes. So changing the aspect ratio. Right. So this is used for generating different types or different values of reference current to load other things, right? So if your basic configuration is providing, uh, uses a reference current of let's call it 10 microamps, right? Um, but you decide that a certain portion of your circuit needs to be biased using 25 microamps. Instead of developing an entirely new circuit to provide 25 microamps where you need it, you can use that 10 microamps and a current mirror, but scale the aspect ratio of a particular transistor in order to achieve 25 microamps of current through that. And the rules for it are pretty straightforward. So let's see, changing the aspect ratio of the transistors lets us scale the copies, okay? So here's our basic thing. But now let's consider, so I'm going to put M1 down here, that this guy has an aspect ratio of M times W over L, okay? So it's just some integer multiple of an aspect ratio. What that's going to do is cause our drain current ID1 to be of the form one over M times I reference. So effectively, if this transistor M1 were actually two transistors connected in parallel, so that it looks like a single transistor with double the aspect ratio, we would find out that our reference current splits up evenly between those two, um, such that the current flowing through any one of those transistors is just going to be one over the number of copies multiplied by the reference current. 
that in turn lowers our gate source voltage or changes the gate source voltage that is going to be applied to everything that we connect to the right hand side of our current pair, right? So over here, for transistor M2, which may be multiple transistors connected in parallel or simply a single transistor with an aspect ratio of N times W over L. Our drain current here, ID2, will come out to be N over M times I ref. So effectively, if we wanted to go from 10 microamps to 25 microamps, we would need N to be five and M to be two. And then we get 25 microamps flowing through ID one. We'd have five microamps flowing through this guy and we can do any kind of permutation there. As long as it's going to be a ratio that can be expressed in integers, we are good to go with making any kind of reference current we want as long as we are able to make sure that all of these copy transistors are in saturation. Because as soon as they fall out of saturation and into the triode region, all bets are off here. So this, Wait, sorry. Like our vital osmosis rules. Right, right. yeah. So this effectively is a review of what we talked about in 336. Now, let's get into more advanced topics, okay? So biasing external circuitry with current mirrors. So for our basic current mirror, we have this configuration. Here's transistor M1 has some aspect ratio of W over L1. Here's transistor M2. Like so. We have an aspect ratio of W over L2. And we can say that this current ID2 is equal to one half mu n C ox W over L2 times VGS1 minus VTH squared. And this should be equal I ref. Yes. VDS2 is greater than VGS1 minus VTH and W over L2 is equal to W over L1. Those are a lot of conditional things while we're at it because this will be shown momentarily. We know that VGS1 
should be VTH plus the square root of twice I ref over UN CX W over L one. All right. So What is this second transistor behaving like? So the short answer is a practical current source. Okay. So the second transistor is doing its damnedest to represent this. Under what constraint does a practical voltage source, excuse me, a practical current source behave like an ideal current source? Because an ideal current source would mean that it's a true perfect replica of our reference current. Exactly right. So if RS, our source resistance, were infinitely large, then our transistor M2 would behave exactly like an ideal current source. So to make current mirror, behave like an ideal current source. We need to make RS large as possible. So what does the source resistance RS look like for one of these guys? So if I have a transistor, like so, and this is our bias voltage, and I want to find out what resistance this thing has. How do I do that? Well, I'm finding effectively the Thevenin equivalent resistance, which means I need to turn off my um, bias voltage source and look in through, in this case, this would be the drain of two, this is the gate of two, and this is the source of two, right? So my gate terminal would be grounded. My source terminal is also grounded. And over here, I'm going to apply a test source. And the ratio 
of my test voltage to my test current is the source resistance that this transistor provides. So Stephen, I'm gonna pick on you again. What is VGS2 in this case? If it's connected up from M1 from VGS2, we can say for this VGS4. So we've turned off. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wouldn't that be an open connection? What's the voltage present at the gate? Well, I, I'm assuming it would be zero if, you've got, if it's ground. Right. right. So what's the voltage present at the source? And this is the source of two, and this is the drain of two while we're at it. Sorry, I didn't have those labeled. Well, if it's VGS2, if the gates at ground, then shouldn't the source two also be ground? Right, so the source is directly connected to ground always. The reason why we're turning off effectively our voltage at the gate here is because we're calculating an, an output resistance. And in order to measure our output resistance, which is a Thevenin equivalent resistance, we need to turn off our um, independent sources. So we know that the bias voltage that is applied at the gate of transistor M2 is a fixed DC voltage. So that's why we're shorting it to ground. So if the gate is at ground and the source is at ground, then obviously VGS has to be zero because there's no potential difference between those two nodes. So once again, we see that this current source doesn't actually do anything. So the ratio of V test over I test is just that resistance R not two. So we see the same thing here as we did looking back at one of our amplifiers a couple of days ago, okay? When we bias with a transistor current source, effectively looks like a resistance R not. So, how do we make that quantity R not larger? There are multiple different things that we can do. Okay. Our first option is to increase the length of M2. So what I mean by that is that if we want it to be a perfect copy, the ratio W over L1 and W over L2 have to be the same. So if transistor M1 had a ratio of 10 to two and transistor um, M2 had a ratio of 50 to 10, their aspect ratios would be the same, but the length of transistor M2 would be five times as long. Well, why is that important? So since R0 is equal to one over lambda I D, And lambda represents the relative change in channel length due to VDS being greater than VGS minus VTH. Making L larger makes lambda, our channel length modulation coefficient, smaller.
when lambda smaller are not larger since it's in the denominator. Right? So we can physically make our devices larger while maintaining the same ratio to cause this resistance R naught to increase. This is one way to do it, and it's not a particularly great way to do it because the larger we make our transistors, the more space we are taking up, right? So this method has diminishing returns and it increases the footprint of our design. And if we're trying to make our design as compact as possible so that there's more space for things on our chip, this is probably not the smartest way to do it. So our second option is source degeneration. So in a source degeneration scheme, what we do is we place a resistor RS between the source terminal of our device and ground. So if we wanted to calculate the output resistance of this configuration, we'd have something like this. So here's our gate. Here's our source. Here's our resistance R not. That looks too much like a B for me. Here's our resistance RS. And between our drain terminal and ground, once again, we are going to apply some test voltage and determine our test current. Clear, we're trying to find. Mm, I'm going to call this R out because I don't want two different RSs being confusing where this is literally the resistance that's placed, uh, the RS in this case is the resistance that's placed between the source terminal and ground, whereas the RS that we were using a moment ago represents the internal impedance of the current source for a practical current source representation, okay? so. Um, as per usual, our resistance here, R out, is going to be the ratio of V test over I test. So we can observe a couple of things. The first is that all of our current I test. flows through the resistance RS, right? So it's going to our current I test that's leaving the positive polarity terminal of our test voltage source is going to split. Some portion of it will flow through our dependent source. Some portion of it will flow through our resistance R naught. Then it will come together or combine at our source node. And then it's only path to ground is down through the resistor RS. So all of the current that's leaving the test voltage source flows through that resistor RS. Another thing that we can observe is that 
our voltage VGS is simply the voltage drop over our resistor RS, positive polarity at the ground node. So we perform Kirchhoff's current law at our drain. What we get is that I test, sorry, I used capital over there, so I should be consistent. Will be equal to V test minus negative VGS. So V test plus VGS all over our resistance R naught plus GM VGS. Um, let's see. We can recognize that our voltage VGS is equal to negative I test times RS, just using good old Ohm's law. And from there, we can rewrite our equation for I test as I test is equal to V test over R naught plus VGS. So that's going to be minus I test times RS over R naught plus GM VGS. So here's GM and then when we substitute in VGS, we're going to have minus I test times RS. Moving all of our I test terms over to the left hand side gives us I test times one plus RS times GM plus one over R naught is equal to V test over R naught. And therefore, our output resistance, V test over I test comes R naught times one plus RS times GM plus one over R naught. Looks like R naught plus RS plus GM R naught RS or approximately GM RS times R naught. So effectively, this source to generation scheme scales our output resistance by a factor of GM, our transconductance at our DC operating point times whatever value we choose for RS. So arguably, we should see that we get a larger output impedance, right? Generally speaking, that's good because it's gonna make our device look more like an ideal current source to whatever we are connecting it to. However, there is a little bit of a problem, okay? So I'm gonna scroll back here 
And we're going to look at these constraints that we talked about. So in order for this device to work how we want it to work, we need channel length modulation to be occurring, right? Because the channel length modulation is what's giving us some output resistance that's making this thing behave like a practical current source. So what's the minimum value for VDS2 that will make that happen? Let's do this in blue. Not supposed to be a trick question or anything. What's the minimum value for VDS2 that will keep transistor M2 operating in saturation? Exactly right. VDS1 minus VTA. So VGS, same thing as VDS1 minus VTH. If we, if our VDS2 gets lower than that, our device automatically enters the triode region. So we've talked our way through what, or we've shown that utilizing source degeneration causes us to experience an increase in output resistance. But let's look at what it does to our system. Okay, so here's VDD. Here's RS over here. So here's M1. Here's RS, this is transistor M2. We know that our R out here is approximately GM2 R2 times R naught two. So, oh shit. What is our voltage here at the gate of both devices, right? So we have some voltage here, VGS1, some voltage here, VGS2, but we also have a voltage drop across our resistor RS. So let's call this current ID1 and this current ID2, assuming that they're equal. We have a voltage drop across our resistor that is equal to ID times RS. So that means our gate voltage is VGS1 plus ID times RS. And that in turn, causes our quantity VD2 minimum to be something different, All right? So let's talk about that. So VD2 minimum. So this is going to be VGS1 minus our threshold voltage, but now we have to add 
a term of I not R because our whole potential is effectively shifted up by an amount I not R because we have some voltage drop across those resistors. So what does this mean to us as designers? Well, if VDD is the highest voltage that we can expect in our system and gate is our lowest voltage, or excuse me, not gate, uh, ground is our lowest voltage, effectively we have increased our output resistance for our device at the expense of what we're gonna call headroom, which is the voltage range from this point in our circuit all the way up to our supply voltage, right? So we are constraining how much play we have between this point in the circuit and VDD as to things that we can effectively connect and guarantee that we are biasing properly. So if we have a circuit where headroom isn't particularly important to us, meaning that we're only going to connect a couple of smaller things here, this isn't an issue. But if we're going to connect something more complex, like an op amp that's consisting of multiple stages and multiple transistors and things like that, between this point in the circuit and our supply voltages, this can be problematic. So, our third option here is to effectively do the exact same thing, except that instead of degenerating with a resistor, we are going to degenerate with another transistor current source. And this is what we called cascoding back in 336. So we have observed that, excuse me, degenerating sources of transistor M1 and M2 with a resistor improves the output resistance of the current source at the expense of decreased DC Headroom. We can attempt to minimize this trade off by cascoding. Transistors. So cascode configuration looks something like this. We're going to be looking into this terminal to figure out what R out is. Let's call this guy transistor M2. Call this guy transistor M4. And if 
we were to break this thing open and look down here, just into transistor M4, what resistance would we see? So if we were looking in through the drain of M4 and looking down, what would we have? Exactly right, just R04. So this configuration, this transistor M4 is acting just like our resistor RS in the previous example. So from that, we can see that R out will be R not two plus R not four plus GM two R not four R not two or approximately GM two R not four R not two. which could be written as GM R naught squared if M1 through M4 are identical transistors, okay? For this to work, M4 must be in saturation, meaning EDS4 has to be EGS4 minus VTH. So now let's look at what this does on our DC operation of our device. And I think this will be a good stopping point for today. All right. So here we have VDD. Our reference current. So here is M3, this is M1. Both of these guys are gonna be diode connected. And then over here on the right hand side, we will have M2. Here's our voltage VD2. Here's VD4. Like so. This is transistor. All right, so let's label a couple of nodes here. So this is VG1. This is VG3. And we are assuming that ID1 ID3, ID2, and ID4 are all equal. So if ID1 is equal to ID2, 
is equal to ID three, equal to ID four. What does this mean? Well, VGS one through four will all be equal to VTH plus square root of twice I ref over UNC ox W over L where all of the transistors have to have the same aspect ratio to make all the currents work up. Let's call this thing right here so that we don't write it over and over and over again. BD sat. Okay. So VG3 will be VTH plus one VD sat. Everybody okay with that? It's literally just VGS3, which is the same thing as VGS4, okay? That being said, BG1 with respect to ground will be something different here, right? So let me explain exactly what I mean by that. So here's our voltage, BGS1. Here's our voltage, BGS3. And we can see very easily that BGS3 is exactly equal to VG3. Well, VG1, using Kirchhoff's voltage law, is going to be VGS1 plus VGS3, right? Which is simply twice VTH plus VD sat. VD4 is VG1 minus VGS2. So let me write over here where VGS2 is so we can see it more easily. So now we're effectively doing Kirchhoff's voltage law for while, excuse me, along the right hand side here. And so we can see that VD4, which is the difference between um, the drain of transistor M4 and ground plus VGS2 brings us up to the gate voltage at our transistor pair of M1 and M2. So VD4 is VG1 minus VGS2, which looks like VTH plus VD sat. Well, why is this important? Effectively, VD4 is higher than it needs to be to keep M4 in saturation. If it were just at VD sat, we would be in saturation. But now we have extra headroom that is being effectively 
wasted by this configuration. BD2 minimum. will be VD4 plus VD sat, which is pH plus two VD sat. So what we're gonna investigate on Wednesday is a scheme by which we can reclaim that head group. Uh, but in doing so, we are going to slightly increase the complexity of our configuration, right? So effectively, we are wasting one VTH worth of headroom to keep this node as low as it can possibly be while keeping all of our transistors in saturation. And so that's what we're going to explore for our next class meeting.